Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It is a pleasure to be back here. I'm a huge fan of the New Schools Project. I think, among other things, they do a better job of creating more important and exciting projects for the benefit of education than any other organization I know. And today is just clear evidence of that. So give yourselves a big hand. This is a really important <laughs> in initiative. You know, I'd love to start with this quote from Einstein. The formulation of the problem is often more essential than the solution. You know, I've been in education 40 odd years. You know, I started teaching when I was 12. But um, what I've come to understand is how fad driven we are. Reform du jour, fad of the month. We're frequently pursuing answers to questions that have not been adequately posed. Solutions to problems that are not always well understood. Why STEM? Why is that so important? And what is STEM? Sam Houston started suggesting some very interesting and different definitions of what good STEM education, in fact, involves. And that's what I would like to explore with you. But fundamentally, I believe we have two challenges in education, neither of which are well understood. Number one, in the new global knowledge economy, all students need new skills. The skills for a successful career, the skills for continuous learning, and the skills for active and informed citizenship have converged. They're the same skills. And they're skills that we neither teach nor assess, even in our very best schools, for the most part. And above and beyond those skills, what I'm going to be talking about today is the importance of being able to innovate in whatever it is you do. So that's half the problem, half the equation. All kids, new skills. The other half of the problem is that this generation, the digital natives, are very differently motivated, both to learn and to work. We have to solve both halves of this equation, which suggests to me the need to reframe the education challenge. This is not about failing schools. And a little more reform is not going to fix us. First of all, it's punitive language. I hate that. A recovering high school English teacher. How many would like to go to reform the school? Raise your hands. <laughs> Terrible. The problem is that our system of education is obsolete and needs reinventing, not reforming. Lest you think that a utopian notion, I'd like to remind folks that we started out with one-room schoolhouses, which we reinvented as we transitioned from a rural agrarian economy to an urban industrial society more than a century ago. Only we still have the factory line, assembly line schools that we created more than a century ago. All right, so let me go into a little more detail here. First of all, let me ask a quick question. How many of you are already familiar with uh, the seven survival skills and the global achievement gap? Raise your hands. Not too many, okay. Well, let me just give a brief summary. I read Tom Friedman's book, The World is Flat, in 2005. How many have read that? Raise your hands. Many of you, good. I got scared because he describes a world where increasingly any job that can be turned into a routine, white collar, blue collar, manufacturing, service, technology, doesn't matter, is very rapidly being either offshored or automated. I talked to him recently, he said the one thing he got wrong in that book was the pace of change. It's happening far, far more quickly than he ever dreamed possible. So as I read that, I got worried about what were the skills our young people, our children, our students were going to need to get and keep a good job. And are they the same skills they'll need for continuous learning and citizenship? So I interviewed a wide variety of executives. And we're going to have some fun today. Brett Carter and I are going to have a, a kind of, of, of an interview like the ones that I did for a period of several years, trying to understand what are the skills that matter most what are the gaps? Talk to executives from, literally from Apple to Unilever to the US military. Talk to community leaders. I talked to college teachers. I talked to recent graduates, asking them what were some of the gaps in, in their education as they saw it now. Came to understand there's a set of core competencies every young person must be on the way to mastering well before the end of high school. Fundamentally, what I came to see is that in this world, there is no longer a competitive advantage to knowing more than the next person, the person next to you. Knowledge has become a commodity. It's free. It's, air. it's like air. It's like water. Not to say it's unimportant, but it's been commoditized. You want the entire MIT curriculum? It's online. How many have been to the Khan Academy website recently? Raise your hands. 3,000 videos on every conceivable topic, free. What the world cares about is what our students can do with what they know. Do they have the skill? Do they have the will? 
Those are different education problems. And that's what I want to try to frame and explain. Skills. Number one, critical thinking and problem solving. Over and over again, executives told me the most important skill for them is the ability to think critically. But they went further. They said the capacity to think critically begins with the ability to ask really good questions, to ask the right question. I love Sam Houston's framing of an idea where powerful teaching is that you answer a question with a more powerful question. Collaboration across networks and leading by influence. Increasingly, all work is being done in teams, and more and more it's being done virtually. So people are connecting and working in virtual atmospheres. Essential that they deeply understand differences, cultural, religious, ethnic. But the ways those teams are led is very different than just a quarter of a century ago. They're led by peers through influence. Agility and adaptability, the pace of change, the complexity of problems absolutely demands that people be agile and adaptable in the workplace. It's an increasingly important capacity. Initiative and entrepreneurialism is Mark Chandler, Vice President of Cisco Systems and General Counsel at Cisco, who explained to me how large companies like his, the senior executives, lay awake at night worrying about keeping that entrepreneurial spirit and sense of initiative alive. He said, if I have an employee who sets and meets five goals, 100%, that's simply no longer good enough. He said, if on the other hand, I have an employee who sets 10 stretch goals and perhaps only succeeds at seven or eight, he or she is a hero. What would that person be in our schools? Put him as two or three out of 10. We penalize failure. C or B student, maybe. I'm going to come back to this problem. Effective oral written communication, the number one complaint of both college teachers and employers. It was a senior executive at Dell who said to me, you know, the reason these kids can't write is because they don't know how to think, meaning they don't know how to reason, they don't know how to construct an argument. And he said, that's only half the problem. The other half of the problem, and I'm quoting him exactly, because as a former English teacher, I love this. He said, they do not know how to write with voice meaning they don't know how to put their own passion and perspective into their communications so as to be truly persuasive. Accessing and analyzing information, we all know it. The amount of information is growing exponentially. That's why it's comparatively less important. How many of you had to memorize the periodic table? Raise your hands. How many are there again? What did you say? I didn't hear that. Whatever number you came up with is wrong because two more were added last week. And planets, are we up one or down one? Is Pluto in the club or out of the club? I haven't checked my news feed lately. Oh, you want to have a competition? Let's see how many can recite the 50 state capitals from memory while I Google them. Let's see who's quicker. <laughs> it's a very different world with that kind of access, that kind of incredible increment, uh, exponential growth of information and accessibility. Lastly, I heard over and over again about the importance of curiosity and imagination. How many have read Dan Pink's book, Drive? Raise your hands. He talks about the importance of curiosity and imagination in the context of a consumer economy, saying that consumers today want products that are more creative and more innovative and more personal and demand more empathy. He said the so-called right brain skills are going to be perhaps even more important than traditional left brain skills. But I've come to see this in a different light, which I'll explain in just a moment. So essentially, what I learned in researching and writing that book that came out just four years ago is that we have a global achievement gap. And that if we merely strive to bring disadvantaged students up to the level of education our middle class students are receiving, we will fail all of our students. And we will not create a viable economy for the future. The gap then is the gap between the new skills all students need for careers, college, and citizenship versus what's taught and tested, even in our very best schools. Let me be clear. I believe in accountability. I think the problem is we're trying to do it on the cheap with predominantly multiple choice factual recall tests that tell us absolutely nothing about college, career, or citizenship readiness. We can make AYP and fail our kids and not prepare them for the future. So I'm calling for accountability 2.0, which we can talk about later, perhaps. OK, so that was 2008. Two things happened immediately when that book came out. First of all, I got a kind of acknowledgment and affirmation that frankly stunned me. Uh, folks from around the world, literally, from Taiwan to Finland to, to uh, Singapore to England, 
and in this country from Wall Street to West Point said, yep, these are the skills we need. These are the skills that are important. But then something else happened. The economy collapsed. And I was forced to ask myself, are these skills enough? Because college graduates were coming home seemingly having a lot of these skills, but not being able to get a job, living at home. Right now today, one third of all recent college grads are living at home, either unemployed or underemployed, one third. Why? Well, as I really studied this problem, I came to understand that these skills, while necessary, are not enough. Because increasingly, the value added, the one thing that will never be commoditized, is the capacity to innovate. And that innovation, especially in STEM fields, but in all fields, social innovation, social entrepreneurship, innovation in all of its forms is the most single, most important and vital commodity and capacity that our children need. So I started working on this new book, and I took a different tact. I started interviewing young people in their 20s who are highly, highly innovative in a variety of ways, many in STEM, but some not in STEM. Then I interviewed their parents, trying to discern if there were patterns of parenting that had made a difference. Then I asked each one of them, was there a teacher or a mentor who'd made a significant difference in your lives? Uh, of the eight whom I studied intensively, three could not name a teacher. I found sad. Five could. Then I went and interviewed each one of the teachers and mentors whom they named. And I discovered something that I still am frankly wrestling with. I discovered that in every single case, these teachers and mentors are outliers in the context of their work life, especially the teachers. These teachers are working and teaching in ways that are very different than many of their peers. But then when I looked at what they did, how they taught, and I'm talking elementary school to graduate school, the entire spectrum, I was stunned at how similar their approaches were. And I came to understand that the culture of schooling is radically at odds with the culture of learning that produces innovators in five essential respects. Number one. We celebrate and reward individual achievement in our schools. It's all about being better than the next kid. Innovation is a team sport. There is no innovation without deep collaboration. Problems are too complex to be able to innovate without collaboration. Number two, we reward specialization. The high school curriculum is divided and conquered by subject content areas called Carnegie units that are 125 years old. Go to college, you expect it to major. You, how do you get tenure by being a specialist? By knowing this much in something this wide. I was told that my dissertation should be a conversation between myself and one or two other people in the world. No, thank you. The world of innovation is all about problem-based learning and studying and understanding problems from a multiple disciplinary perspective. Judy Gilbert, whom I interviewed, director of talent at Google, said to me, if there was one thing educators had to understand, it's that problems can neither be understood nor solved within the bright lines of academic disciplines. We in education penalize failure. We give people bad grades. We create risk-averse students who believe their job is to figure out what the teacher wants. And the teachers often have to figure out what the principal or superintendent wants. And they have to figure out what the state or the feds want. It's a compliance-based, risk-averse system.